For any young man who's ever looked up at the night sky and wondered about climbing into a spacecraft and traveling faster than light to another world and waging war there in a giant 12-meter battle mech, the time of war is the game for you. I don't really do reviews. Now, those of you who've gone to the playlist that I have on my channel, the Under the Hood, um, saying, sure, you do lots of reviews. Uh, I keep calling them overviews in that playlist for the very simple reason that I'm not talking about how they play, generally speaking. I'm just opening up the book, going through it, maybe talking about how it's connected to other games and trying to share uh, what it's like to actually have the product and uh, for people who don't have the opportunity to pick it up off the shelf. Uh, that's basically what I look for on the internet because there are absolutely no game stores that I can go to where I live over here on the other side of the earth. And so that's what I in turn produce. I also don't think an awful lot of reviews because without knowing the reviewer, Basically, what you're exposing yourself to is a lot of opinion, and then that person's justification for that opinion, and your experience may differ widely, wildly, ridiculously. All right, there are a lot of games out there that some Yahoo on the internet says is crap, and then it crashes and burns, and it shouldn't have. So, um, I don't like doing reviews, but I've wanted to do a review of this game because I really feel that, <laughs> in my opinion, it's a, a very, very solid system which has a very long history of development and uh, is, an, is my favorite expression of how to play in that universe. Fair enough. So the game that I'm talking about is actually a time of war. And I've wanted to, like I said, review this for a while but uh, now's the time. So this is A Time of War by Catalyst Game Labs. It's basically the fourth edition of MechWarrior. Now they can't use the MechWarrior name anymore because of the ridiculousness of, of IP agreements. But anyway, that's what this is. A Time of War is the Battletech MechWarrior role-playing game. I'll also be looking at the companion book, which is suitably titled The Time of War Companion. Not because I consider it to be a necessary addition to the rules, but because it has certain elements in it which are very useful. They're expansions of existing rules uh, when you're ready for it, and uh, um, some useful tools that I adopted immediately as soon as the book was released. I played Battletech without them, or I played A Time of War without them for more than two years. So, you know, not necessary, but useful. So this review will try to give you a good look between the covers of the book, talk about how the mechanics work, what it's like to learn the game and run the game. Now, my experience is as an experienced Battletech player, an experienced Mech Warrior player, and a long-term gamer, picking up this rule set and playing with people that I've played with for many, many, many years, played Battletech with, played Mech Warrior with, and uh, who are of an age <laughs> with me uh, in terms of, of role playing. Um, so that was my experience. So I'll give my thoughts on what it might be like as a newcomer to gaming or a newcomer to the Battletech universe trying to pick up this book and, and run with it, maybe to alleviate your fears or to, uh, to point you in the right direction of things that you might need to know before you play. The book is available still, if you look around for it, in hardcover at a reasonable price considering how dense it is, how heavy it is, how small the font is, and just how much information is, is packed into it and the, the quality of the book itself. It's also available at an incredibly reasonable price, just $15 usually on, on drive-through, um, 
which is a fantastic introduction to the role-playing side of the Battletech universe at a, at a very great price. So um, that's how this review will work. So let's get on to it. It's fairly difficult to know where to begin with a review of a MechWarrior game. Battletech's been around for 30 years. The universe is incredibly detailed. And as a game master, or even as a player, you may feel like you are responsible to know all of that in-game history. And we're talking about a lot of history. Now, when I was introduced to the game, there really only was one, one era of it. You know, you're playing, and as the as new products were released, time was moving forward. So it was easy to, to keep up if you were so inclined. Or you could continue to play in that same, you know, that same year, you know, that same level of technology, that same uh, social environment, that same iteration of the universe. But in addition to moving forward through time, the designers also took the game backward in time. You know, because the Battletech universe, at the point where it was introduced, was in a technological dark ages. Now, as the timeline moves forward, of course, the universe crawls its way out of that hole. And as it goes backwards, of course, it uh, does the opposite. And so it doesn't crawl deeper into the hole. You get my meaning. So uh, there are different types of technology to become familiar with, different political factions or different expressions of those political factions, and it's all incredibly detailed. I mean, at a basic level, we're dealing with five major political houses and then periphery, you know, small free states uh, out in the, the boundaries of known space. And, and then, of course, at a certain point in the timeline, you come off with a with a divergent uh, civilization of humanity known as the clans who come in and invade from the from the outside trying to tear down the corrupt and misguided structures they see uh, holding the the cradle of, of humanity's birthplace earth so uh, there's a lot going on just in the very early days of the game and it's this development has been going on, as I said, for, for 30 years. So that can be very intimidating. And when you pick up the core book to play A Time of War, what are you getting yourself into? Well, we can start there. The core book primes you to play in basically the period that's considered now in the Battletech universe. And although this came out in, or this, this version was printed in 2010, the, the universe has only slightly begun to, to move forward and to, to jump into other things. So it's still quite easy to get uh, information from this period. And Catalyst, to their credit, is releasing a ton of information in all the published eras. And they are including updates in the backs of, of these releases for the role-playing game, which... Uh, I find extremely useful. Now, as an experienced player, I can come into this game, look at how characters are generated, and kind of unconsciously know how to tweak the skills so or you know the relationships uh, between different factions, so that accuracy, historical accuracy, is maintained. As a newcomer this would be a challenge. And so these, these supplemental books for the different eras make character design very, very easy. So uh, it's very helpful uh, for the player and kudos to Catalyst for doing that. So as you start out, what you discover is that the game introduces you, set, introduces you to the setting as it is now. So if you know nothing about Battletech, the core book will help you. This will fill you in on how society works, what the basic history of the universe is, what people in that universe consider to be normal, how they view each other. And then this brings you up to a discussion of 
how to make a character. And how to make a character is almost like a mini game in itself. It uses a life path system, which has appeared in other iterations of MechWarrior and in many other games. And this walks you through the basic stages of life. What was your character doing at that time? What skills and, and what societies were they exposed to at that time? What kind of culture are they absorbing? And as you move through that process, aging your character up to the point you wish to play them, you are being exposed to very short lists of skills that make sense for them to have had exposure to and possibly learned in that time. And you allocate small units of points at each of those stages until you reach the end and say, okay, my character's finished, or I've used up all my points, my character's finished. And you have not only designed a well-balanced and appropriate character for the universe, you have learned something about the universe, you have learned something about the occupation and the exposure that that character has had, and you've learned a lot about that character because as you move through the process, the ideas are just exploding about where they came from, what they did, how they came to be the way they are when play starts. This is very cool. Now to get there can be a little intimidating because what you see in the in the rule book at first is you have 4,500 points to assign. It's like, holy crap, you know, like for someone from a World of Darkness background where you're, you're assigning, you know, seven, five, and three points, something like that, um, this can be shocking. I've got 4,500 points or, and I could have more points and I get points for aging and I get points for this, that, and the other thing. Well, it's not really like it sounds. The 4,500 points figure, or any number of thousand points figure, um, allows you to, as an experienced player of the game, bypass the life path process of slowly aging your character in increments and just pay for the skills your character wants and needs. So this is one way. Some people might abuse that system and, and produce characters that are really you know, one-trick ponies with ridiculous uh, combat skills or ridiculous social skills or whatever, but that's on them. That's not the fault of the game. If you're approaching it through the life path system, then you're also not really dealing with this 4,500 point figure. What you're doing, as I said before, is moving through discrete stages in the character's life, meaning you are told how much that stage of life costs in terms of points. And we're talking with a, you know, a couple of hundred points and you're assigning them uh, in groups of, of 10, which is quite easy, to the skills in that, in that section of the, of the life path. So you're never ever if you go through the life path system, having to deal with thousands and thousands of points, you're making a few discrete decisions about, do I know how to navigate in space or not? You know, what kind of pilot am I? That kind of thing. It's not as bad as it sounds. Now, the first time you go through, there are a lot of options and it's really best to start at the first page of character creation and work your way through. Now, what I mean by that is, as a newcomer to the game, read the chapter on character creation. Read over the skills and the traits. The traits are those aspects of your character that aren't expressed by your skills, such as uh, a resistance to G-forces. If you're playing an aerospace pilot, this would be handy. Or you are a fast learner or a slow learner. Um, someone's out to get you or all the members of your family, or you have rank or you have money or, and so on and so on. These traits are also important parts of the character and the combination of the character's skills and the character's traits and the character's attributes, that experience of moving through character creation and assigning all of these things helps you clearly define and discover your character as you create them. 
Now, again, as I said earlier, as an experienced player, you can just drop points, make your character, and go. And that's also quite easy. Time to make a character. The first time I made a character as an experienced uh, Battletech player, as a person who had played earlier editions of MechWarrior, first and second edition, not third, it took me, when I sat down to make the character, about an hour to build the character. Now, I do it a lot faster. Uh, and that's simple familiarity with uh, how granular the skills are um, and what the life path options are. So now I can go in uh, thinking that this time I want to follow this path rather than having to read all the paths that first time to see what they are. So it may read or seem intimidating or long, but in reality, once you have read through the book and become familiar with it, it's not as big of an investment as you might think, and certainly uh, comparable to many other games on the market. Coming as it does from a tabletop skirmish game or war game, you might expect that it's a very detailed combat simulator, very, very complicated, and that sort of thing. And to a certain degree, you would be correct. It certainly has its fair amount of what we call crunch. However, the mechanic itself is simply 2d6. That's it. You're rolling 2d6. You don't need any other dice ever. 2d6. So learning how everything works takes a pretty small amount of time. Learning when you need to check for a rule existing uh, or how to apply a rule takes a certain amount of time, but again, not as much as some other games. Certainly those games out there uh, with long histories with no kind of unified mechanic. So yeah, 2d6. Now the way that it works is that you're rolling 2d6 and adding modifiers. These are situational modifiers or modifiers by skill. So for example, if you were attempting to navigate in space, you're the, the pilot of a small craft and it's your job to compute the course then you have a skill for navigation of small craft or spacecraft. And that has a number. It's a small number. It might be a four or a five, or it might be a two. Uh, it might be an eight. Right? Whatever that number is, you're going to add it to your 2d6 roll. Okay. Now there'll be modifiers based on the situation. Are you doing this at gunpoint? Um, <laughs> are pirates in you know rickety vessels approaching your craft uh, as its orbit is decaying and you know, all kinds of horrific stuff like that? Are you having to do the orbital calculations longhand? You know, positive and negative modifiers will apply to the role, and they'll apply in a very simple way. Battletech loves charts. Battletech players seem to love charts. And there are a lot of charts in this book and pretty much any Battletech book you will ever find. But they usually break down into something simple. Like if we take range, for example, is it at short range, medium range, or long range? That's usually all you ever have to deal with. Is the person operating under stress? Yes or no? Um, is it a difficult situation? Yes or no? You know, stuff, it's just questions like this, common sense stuff. And as you go through the charts a few times, you begin to see how the positive and negative modifiers are assigned. It might be a plus one, might be a plus two, might be a plus three. In an extreme case, might be a a negative one, negative two, or negative three in an extreme case. And this will be consistently applied. 
Consistency is good because it helps you learn the system faster. The players aren't surprised by your judgments. You are not surprised by what you find in a chart as you're trying to frame the role for the players. And things just make sense. Players begin to be able to predict their chances, which is something that you want because you want them to be able to make informed decisions in order to have a fun game. So, and this game is fun. The die rolling is kept to a minimum. I hate to use the word elegant, but I'm going to use the word elegant. The mechanic is often elegant. Many games have difficulty with things like grappling or unarmed combat. Uh, this game does not. It works really, really well. The game basically operates with 2d6 rolls, which are versus target numbers, or 2d6 rolls, which are opposed rolls. The game also uses margins of success and margins of failure, which can stage up effects or stage down effects. Now, I mentioned that it was just a 2d6 roll. And what I mean by that is just that. There are no rolls for damage. Right? And uh, you will find that once you've got applying modifiers under your belt, and if you've come from other games in the past, you probably already have this skill. Players are rolling a die, and you are then narrating the effects. You know how much damage a weapon does. You know what the effect of a bribe or, a, or you know, trying to barter or trying to coerce someone to do something. You know what the, what the effects are as you frame the role. There's no consulting at that point. You just, you just go. So let's take a look at the books rather than just sit and talk about them. So here we have the role-playing game, Time of War, the Battletech RPG, and we have the companion, a Time of War companion. If you wanted to have a fairly complete Battletech experience going beyond what these two books allow, meaning if you wanted to branch into including the miniatures-based combat, specifically involving the mechs, not aerospace, not so much uh, armor, but definitely including infantry, so, you know, the classic Battletech struggles, then you would also want the Battletech introductory box set, which I have several videos about elsewhere on the channel, and you can take a look at them there. I'm not going to waste time in this review looking at that stuff again, but as I've mentioned elsewhere in the clip, or will mention elsewhere in the clip, uh, a new edition of that box set with much higher quality of components has just been released. And at the time of recording, they're having a sale where if you buy two copies of the intro box set, you will be given an additional packet of all the miniatures. This is something that if you are getting into Battletech for the first time, uh, it would be too hard to pass up, in my opinion. All right, so let's take a look inside the books. These books are extremely heavy, high quality paper, glossy, thick, strong covers, great bindings. They weigh a ton. They're like Battletech armor all by themselves. I was really happy when I got these books in my hands. I wasn't expecting anything like them. A Time of War is a big book. It's one of those 400 page RPG books. In your hand, it probably doesn't look like much until you actually pick it up and feel the heft. And opening it up, you see that the font is a pretty reasonable size, you know, but a little on the small side for, for some. So two columns throughout. There's actually minimal art, and the art varies from uh, photographs of miniatures and terrain to maybe abstract paintings or more you know, photorealistic style paintings. So you get a, a good gamut. You get the old black and white line art and, and so on. But basically what you're getting is a lot of text. Now you're probably also saying, holy crap, there's a lot of charts. 
And that might seem intimidating to some, especially if you get into complicated things like armor and barrier effects. However, these are only complicated until you use them. So as you go through the book, you'll notice that there are these colored tabs on each page. And while it's unfortunate that they're not really clear from the outside edge, uh, it does make flipping through the chapters pretty speedy. Of course, the PDF is entirely bookmarked, almost exhaustively bookmarked. It's very, very fast and efficient to use the PDF. So let's take a look at a sample chart um, like fatigue accumulation. What you're really looking at is you're looking for one entry. I mean, this isn't scaled or anything. This is, are the characters in high or low gravity? Then apply a modifier based on that gravity. Are they running or crawling? Then fatigue of plus three per minutes related to their body. All of that seems complicated until you actually have a character sheet and have made a character, and then it's just second nature. Hit locations, likewise, or specific wound effects. I got hit in the head, which means I'm dazed. Dazed means I suffer 1d6 additional fatigue damage points. These are actual damage that you track on the character sheet in bubbles. So if someone says you take you know four levels of fatigue, it's simply a matter of ticking off four boxes. It's nothing really complicated. So while the game has a fairly steep learning curve, that learning curve is primarily learning what the game covers and when to apply it. The basic co combat modifiers it's one page. And that one page is the sort of thing that even in a very narrative game involving very minimal system, you're still asking yourself. Things like, how far away are the combatants? Range. Is there cover? Cover. Did anybody move, right? And is that movement significant enough to mean that there would be a penalty or a bonus? The size of the thing, right? Am I shooting at a 100-ton dropship dropping out of the sky on a blazing trail of fusion-heated gases? Or am I shooting at a rabbit dodging through the bushes, right? The size of the thing. What was I doing as I fired? What was the thing I was firing at doing? I mean, you know, was there aiming? Just... Very, very basic stuff. Things that you are normally describing to the player or the player is describing back to you and right next to that very simple English thing like you're firing at something of monstrous size or the attacker is firing with their offhand, you know, something like that. There is a number and the number applies directly to the role. Right? So if I'm firing through other characters, I might suffer a minus one to my roll. So how does rolling work? Well, as I mentioned elsewhere in the clip, rolling is 2d6 plus modifiers. Right now we're looking at pages of skills. Right? So we've got stealth, for example, and I might have a stealth of three or one or zero. All right, zero means that I have been exposed to that skill. I'm starting to learn it. Four is a professional level and on up you go into more and more skill. I roll 2d6, I add the level of my skill to it. So it might be a 2d6 roll plus five. Okay, so I know that my minimum roll is now going to be seven. And I have a target number to hit if I'm just trying to do something without being actively resisted by something else. Right? So in combat, often I'll have an opposed roll. I'll roll my 2d6 plus my skill level plus any modifiers, and so will my opponent, and we'll compare our rolls. If, however, there is no active opponent in the scene, then I'm rolling against a target number. Say I'm calculating a jump, or I am writing uh, a love sonnet. <laughs> a target number is assigned. 
modifiers are assigned, 2d6 plus your skill level is rolled, and basically you're done. Except that in some cases you may want to or need to apply margins of success or margins of failure. By how much did you succeed or by how much did you fail the roll, and it might modify the effect somewhat. But this is it. There are no rolls for damage. There are no rolls for resisting damage. It's one roll, narrate the effect. Because this is a futuristic, science fiction based game, there are a lot of skills. But they did try to get it down to a more manageable number, and as I mentioned elsewhere in the review, the process of generating a character walks you through skill selection so that it doesn't become that long burden of trying to pick from a list of hundreds and hundreds of skills. There aren't even hundreds of hundreds of skills. In fact, the chart you're looking at now, these are the skills. Now how do they work? I mentioned earlier that you assign a level to it, a level from zero up. All right. A professional level is considered to be four. So target numbers are associated and the skill also has a classification. So let's take a look at that list and take an example. Now, the skills are arranged according to complexity. And what I mean by that is they're given, they're given a rating of either complex or simple. Meaning, during a turn, how many things can a character do in that time? Right? So basically, you can look at it that a character can do one complex action or two simple actions in a turn. So the skills are described as being either complex or simple. The other quality assigned to skills is whether they are basic or advanced, and this relates to training, how they progress, and so on. The third category is a tiered skill, and a tiered skill operates at a certain level of proficiency from level 0 through level 3, but once a character decides to commit to raising it to level 4, they suddenly become special, let's say. So this might be reflected in martial arts or might be reflected in hacking, where there's a significant difference in capability from the normal person and the specialist in this particular skill. Now, while that might seem confusing, what this really does is represent the idea between what level should I take as a player to represent the skill I want for my character. Not everybody wants to be a master martial artist. They want to be competent fighters. And not everyone wants to play a character who is a, you know, a flame hot hacker, right? They want to be competent with computers. This system using tiered skills allows you to do that very simply, right? You know you don't want to play the hacker character, you know, you don't want to get into those situations or imagine your character ever having studied like that, then you know to take three or less in computers and computer skill and you never have to never have to worry about it. But if you do invest those points, you're going your character is going to be treated differently by the system. How does that work? Well we have to take a step back. Along with the skill name there's what's called a skill link. And the link is a link to an attribute. Now these linked attributes have an effect. They can transfer their modifiers to your roll result. So if you have a plus one modifier because you have a high dexterity, then a dex-based skill after you roll will add a plus one to it, which is quite significant in this system. So looking at the idea of tiers again, We've got computers, the basic tier, and we've got computers, the advanced tier. At the basic tier, you're able to add any bonuses from your intelligence in. The, the basis of that skill is listed as intelligence. But in the advanced tier, any bonuses that come from dexterity or intelligence can be added in. And this could be quite significant. Now these two character archetypes represent the... I guess the diversity uh, with which you can approach character creation in this game. You notice that in the relevant skills list, 
there are comparatively fewer shown for the face man than there are for the scout, who even had to shrink it down to font sizes to make it on the page. Tons and tons and tons of equipment and tons and tons of skills represented for this character, all at a relatively low level. There's a few at four, but most of them are zeros, ones, and twos. Compared to the face, who has both higher attributes and higher skill levels overall. All of these choices are up to you. Fewer skills, more skills, higher attributes, lower attributes. All of these things are yours to control. They have an effect on the character's toughness, the character's uh, representation in the game world, but not to the point where you are feeling like you just don't have enough points to do the job. If you do have that feeling, then basically you're trying to do too much. You're trying to be superhumanly strong and tough and dexterous and smart and charismatic and have a high uh, resistance, a strong will, and be incredibly lucky, plus being professionally rated in every skill known to man. Right. Uh, this is a problem when you have a basically a point-based system, and it's something that we all have to get over at some point. Where is your character strong? Where are they weak? That's the fun of a point-based system, and you get to decide. Now, by now, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, wow, the game looks way too complicated for me. But honestly, these two pages, this is how the game works. This is basic action resolution fits on two pages. Most of those two pages are taken up by charts, <laughs> which uh, are a lot easier to use than you may think. What kind of check am I making? You find one line and you get your answer. What kind of modifier do I need to apply? You find one line and you have your answer. Right. Down here in this little box is how to read the skills from the tabletop skirmish game point of view, or read the skills from the role-playing point of view. This is your conversion, conveniently on this page. How fumbles work, how to make a roll, how to apply modifiers, right? This small section here, this little paragraph, is the most complicated thing, and that's recognizing what kind of skill check that you're making. So, there are skill checks, and there are attribute checks, and there are untrained skills. Right. So, are you making a check using the level of your skill? Are you making a check based on an attribute, meaning there's no skill that applies, right? such as, I don't know, eating uh, rotten food and getting sick, right? This would be based on the character's body, not on their skill of right? Of what? If there's no applicable skill, it defaults to attributes. And then there's the untrained skill. Many skills you cannot attempt untrained, such as nuclear physics. However, some skills you can. In those cases, you use the untrained skills check. So, if you're making a skill check, you get a target number. If you're making an attribute check, because there is no appropriate skill, you get a target number. And if you're making an untrained skill check, you guessed it, a target number. Very simple. Now, let's take a look at the chart which explains all that. If you're making a skill check with a simple basic skill, you have a target number of 7. With a simple advanced skill, you get a target number of 8. A complex basic skill, target number of 8, and a skill check for complex advanced, a target number of 9. And all of these things are listed with the skill when you buy it and put it on your sheet, so you never really need to look this up. The attribute check, you have the choice of the single attribute check or the double attribute check, if two were to apply. And they each have a different target number. This also applies for the untrained skill check. So, target numbers, as listed in the game, will either be 7, 8, 9, 12, or 18. 
and they're on this teeny tiny little chart on this one page or on the Game Master screen or on your character sheet to find. Pretty easy. These are all strong points of the game. Where does the system start to fall down? In past editions of MechWarrior, the game fell down because people wanted to play MechWarriors, even though the game provided them with the option to be uh, merchants or politicians or spies or whatever. People wanted to play MechWarriors or at least experience the iconic machinery of the universe in the game, such as battle mechs and dropships and and jump ships and the like. So previous versions of the game did not make this easy. The mechanic for the role-playing game was different enough from the tabletop skirmish game that you couldn't easily blend them. You're either playing one or the other. This version of the game is the first one I feel where you can just seamlessly mix and match. You can literally be having a role-play session in you know, the barracks, have an alert called, and as you're narrating the attacking forces coming in, people can be putting the maps out on the table, getting their, their Battletech miniatures out on the table, getting their oh, 2d6, the exact same amount of dice and the exact same structure for modifiers ready. The only thing that they have to remember is that in the role-playing game, they the designers wanted there to be a broader range than just 2 to 12, and so things add up, right? Whereas in the tabletop game, things go down. So a higher skill is better in the role-playing game, and a lower skill is better in the, in the tabletop skirmish game, uh, because that skill was determining your target number. But this is nothing that you ever really need to worry about. It's nothing that needs to be converted, right? You can, sit, you can just keep playing the role-playing game and everything continues to work, okay? So this still sounds like a positive. Why am I bringing it up in the possible negatives section? Well, in the core book, of course, it's filled with everything you need to know to play a person in the Battletech universe, a pretty well fleshed out person. It doesn't get into much in the way of machines. It's a lot of gear, tons and tons of gear, and good advice on simulating gear and simulating planets. And even more advice for this is found in the companion. But you're not going to find mechs in here. You're not going to find tanks. You're not going to find dropships and that sort of thing. And that means that if you want to bring this part of the Battletech experience into your game, you need more stuff. So that's for the newcomer. That's a bit of a setback. You can't really just kind of hand wave being in a, in a battle mech. You do need to know um, how it works. Now, that said, they give you all the rules that you need to know to interact at all the zoom levels in the game. You can be a guy on the street throwing rocks at a battle mech. The system can accommodate you. Or you can be the pilot in the battle mech. But where the system lets you down is you don't know anything about that battle mech if you don't have the technical readouts uh, that tell you what weapons and speed and, and such that the machine travels. So more support is in this game than any previous game for mixing the two games together. But in order to mix them together properly, you do need both games. Not everyone may want to make that kind of investment. The introductory box set for the tabletop skirmish game is uh, now being re-released and meaning you can get 24 miniatures and you know, two high quality maps, all the rules that you need to play the, the miniatures game. And you can get this for, if I understand correctly, the 50 to $60 range, but about the same as buying, you know, big uh, hardcover RPG books. So if your group wanted to buy one copy of the rule book and one copy of the introductory box set for the miniatures game, you would literally have 
everything you needed to tell exciting mech stories for quite some time. If you wanted to get access to different machines in the universe, uh, then you would be basically looking at getting cheap PDF downloads in the six to ten dollar range uh, for specific types of machines or there are larger collections available uh, for more. You can always pay more, <laughs> but Catalyst does seem to hit all these different price points for the different levels of seriousness of, uh, of the gamers who try their product. So I, I kind of like that. For those who are not interested in including the miniatures game, the tabletop skirmish game with their role-playing game, and that really is the intention of the role-playing game, abstracting the warfare elements of the setting it is a time of war. Abstracting those elements is quite easy. And if you have no experience with the Battletech skirmish game, that's probably the best option. So the game provides all of the information that you will need for running those combats, except for the statistics of the machines involved in whatever skirmishes may come up, which means that you have some options. These are to just make them up yourself using the information which is supplied in the book and where the book will let you down there is in vehicle scale weaponry. Or to obtain one of the technical readouts, which you'll see abbreviated as TRO, and these are combined together by period or era, such as 3025 or 3055 or 3143 or 2750, something like that. They'll just be dated. And those books will contain the iconic vehicles of that time period with a lot of very realistic, very... Uh, detailed and engaging fluff to go along with them. Some players will fall in love with the particular image of a machine, of us, an aerospace fighter or a mech or a dropship. They like how it looks and they love the write-up that goes along with it, which details all the quirks and weaknesses and redesigns and variants that have cropped up over the years that that particular machine has been in service. It's one of the, the big hooks of Battletech is the simulation of technical writing that goes along with all the setting information. So using one of the technical readouts is a very viable option. Now, the reason why so much of this review has focused on mixing the war game with the role-playing game is simply that for experienced Battletech players, Battletech, the war game or the skirmish game, is the baseline of the understanding or appreciation of the universe. And you are expanding that with the role-playing game. So that's the, the way in for, I believe, the largest number of players of this game, is that you are adding in things that go away from the main focus of the game, which is the warfare. Now, the role-playing game has within it all the rules that you need to stay in one system of rules, the role-playing rules, with their tactical addendum, which blends in seamlessly with the standard tabletop skirmish rules for the miniatures, so that you don't have to switch back and forth with systems. You simply have to choose a level of scale. And by that, I mean, are you focusing in at the individual human level or at the mech and mechanized infantry level or a larger or further zoom level where you're including 
more and different units, such as an interstellar invasion force. How far out do you want to zoom? The system, uh, the tactical addendum, deals with making that happen in the context of the role-playing game. And it, like I said before, seamlessly merges with the original mechanics for the skirmish game. So it simply replaces them. You can use all of the core books for the skirmish game without really having to adjust anything. So that's the huge advantage there. And for a long-term Battletech player, that makes a time of war a really great add-on to all of the stuff that they already have. For a player coming in for whom the role-playing game will be the entry point, then the type of entry you're making should be planned out. You will either need to embrace the idea of including the miniatures skirmish game and figuring out how you will do that, if you will actually use miniatures or not, if you want to use cardboard chits, if you if you just want to do theater of the mind, right, that sort of thing. But if you do intend to include the mechanized warfare aspects of the Battletech universe, then having access to those iconic machines will at some point become necessary. So this could be most easily done by getting the introductory box set, which has the most iconic mechs and maps and dice and all that crap. Uh, and then the next option would be in getting the core miniatures rules, which is total warfare. And if you didn't care so much about the iconic machines, a cheap alternative is the tech manual, which instructs players on how to build their own machines, which quite honestly is where much of the early fun we have with Battletech came from. Building your own mech. So then it wouldn't matter that you didn't have any of the technical readouts, uh, you could simply build your own as needed. Okay, so that's an overview of the game in very broad strokes. Why do you need the companion? The companion deals with world building, uh, you know, like environmental effects and that sort of thing. It also provides you with rules for creating alien creatures. Now, one of the rules of the Battletech universe is that it's humans only. And if you as the game master want to bring in an alien race, that's entirely on you. It's not a part of the Battletech universe. But you're free to do it, of course. And once you've made a few characters, it would be quite an easy thing to do. The companion also gets into even more detailed combat systems. You have the option to do abstract combat or hit location based combat with special effects for those locations in the core game. The companion expands those rules out into more and let's say more graphic options. Um, I experimented with these rules in uh, a campaign, a short-lived campaign, and I quite enjoyed them. Uh, they do mean referencing charts and so for the first few weeks of playing with these expanded rules, people would be looking at charts. Um, and if this doesn't appeal to you, this is certainly not a necessary system. It's just a fun add-on once you've got the system under your belt. In many ways, the A Time of War companion dials everything up to 12 or 13. Forget 11. This has detailed rules on how to create the environment of the world. It has uh, advanced rules for combat, man-to-man uh, -man combat in the game. It has design rules for alien creatures on these alien worlds that you have just invented. And some pretty solid game mastering advice, as well as a ton of adventuring seeds based on the kind of campaign that you would like to set up. Now, I, as I said elsewhere in this clip, I by no means consider it to be essential, but if you can get it, do get it, because if you play the game for a long time, you'll appreciate having it. It adds in the kind of detail that a game that you've become comfortable with is enhanced by having. Let's take a look at the table of contents. 
Now, the Companion is a 300-page book. It starts out with what's called advanced gameplay, uh, going through different rules for how to use Edge, which is kind of like the luck or, or fate uh, point system available in the game. There are looks at different types of combat actions and then different rules for advanced traits, which we talked about before, such as rank and... Uh, wealth and the vehicle traits and, and that sort of thing. So there's expansion there. There's the advanced tactical combat, which deals primarily with battle armor, which is the power armor available in the universe. Advanced character creation offering more life paths and, and different things to do with templates there. The advanced creatures section, which I mentioned, basic world building. A lot of new equipment. And then a whole section on campaigns. Finally, it rounds up with how to more quickly make NPCs that fill a specific function at a known power level for the Game Master. So let's look inside the table of contents. The book itself is laid out much the same way. A lot of text, some very good art, some, you know more plain or black and white art, lots and lots of charts that are very quick to use, and again, very clear indication at all times where you are and where everything is. It has exhaustive index, and the PDF likewise is very, very well linked. If you were a player of MechWarrior, three and you wanted to convert your characters you can probably pretty much do it by yourself but for some of the skills which vanished or some of the traits which changed their value in the system there is a ready-made conversion for you and as always with modern game books there's lots of fiction and setting material to expand your awareness of the world and this pretty much ends my look inside the books so, to sum up, the basic mechanics for using the game are simple. The amount of background information and the amount of information in the terms of charts to teach you how modifiers work in the game, I would consider to be an investment of time. If you're not familiar with the tabletop skirmish game, if you've never played Battletech before, uh, or if you're not an experienced role player with games with a lot of uh, system detail, system granularity, or crunch, um, then this game is not a pick-up-and-play game, no matter how simple it becomes. Um, it's just not. There are a lot of character options. There are a lot of character skills to know about. There is a very, very detailed setting, which it's only to your advantage to know if you're running and playing uh, in that world. Uh, as detailed as any other fictional setting out there, and much more detailed than a lot of them. Um, so be prepared if you are buying this game and you aren't familiar with Battletech, be prepared to immerse yourself in the world. The game system, once you've read through the core book and, and once you've acquainted yourself with what Battletech is and, and what it's internal culture signifies, the game mechanics will take care of themselves. It's really, really easy to play this game once you know what you're doing. But that once you know what you're doing thing, this is an investment of time and energy. I personally think it's worth it. I guess one of the factors that would determine whether or not you, the viewer, thinks it's worth it is how much you like giant robots, uh, ages of war, and a fully fleshed out universe that allows for political machinations, economic machinations, or any combination in between. It's a really, really rich universe that should be experienced at least once in your gaming career. So this is my attempt at a review of A Time of War. And if you have any questions, please feel free to engage me in the comments. I love to talk about games.